I want to read this. I have this, I wrote this down. So it was wrote earlier today. If we don't know ourself, we won't know how to live. I read it again. If we don't know ourself, we won't know how to live. And that is what is at the heart of every human being. How to live and be happy. But, but we know that and we find that by knowing ourselves. And that, you know, of course, that's the, that's the aphorism above the temple door in Delphi is know thyself, which most of the ancient materials are based off that idea, know yourself. Okay, uh, if you have a Bible, I want you to open your Bible. Uh, you know, in many, many ways, uh, it is becoming a outdated book. Sad to say, that's because of how it has been translated and used for hundreds of years. If it were truly used the way that it was written, which was not a history book, it was a book about the mystery. Here you go, Martin. Here. It one. was not a history right book. Right off, it's a, right off this lady's desk. It's a book about the mystery of the tabernacle, the temple, the house that God built. And of course, that's something that I hear in the songs that you guys sing. Jamie rewrites the words to songs. I, so, you know, I, I, for me, that's very encouraging because I realize that's such a cross grain thought because it doesn't flow with the norm or the natural. The natural people, the normal people, they want to make it a history book. And, and we are all taught that from early, early on it, that we want to make it a history book. But uh, hallelujah, it's, uh, it's becoming less and less popular in that arena. And I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to, to think that. Because uh, anyway, I've got some things I wanted to read and share and read from a couple of my favorite authors, Alvin Boyd Coon and Carlos Sars. Uh, but uh, Revelations chapter 11, and I know that this is probably in this place a passage of scripture that's heard occasionally, not very often, but occasionally, but in most church circles or in most places that, uh, where people gather and call it a church, they don't even know this passage of scripture is in here. And so, uh, most of the words that have ideas and concepts built in them from the Bible are dressed in a false history. They're dressed in what would appear to be a historical setting. And so when I say words, I'm talking about there are words like the fall of man. We, that, that's a concept and an idea we've all been given and it's rooted in misunderstanding and false interpretations from the scriptures because there's not anything in the scripture about the fall of man or the fall of a man. But yet that idea, that concept that we have, and many times we think out of these deep-rooted concepts and don't recognize we think out of these ideas. We, many times we, uh, we'll say things, you know, uh, out of that idea, that, that use. So, the words in the Bible have been dressed in false historical concepts, thus giving us the wrong idea and or paradigm, the root from which we think gives us the wrong paradigm. And if we think that something is one way when it's not, and we believe it's that way, we are believing in a false concept. And so that's a paradigm that it's difficult to shift. I don't care who you are, it's difficult to shift your ideologies and to change the ways that, that you've been taught to believe. I don't care who you are, it's difficult to do that. So this passage of scripture addresses this in a way that I want to just look at and talk about some this morning. And it's Revelation chapter 11. And before I even read that, let me go ahead and uh, put this on the board. Jay. H V H in which 
we get from those Hebrew glyphs, that's the, that's the Hebrew yod, hey, vav, hey. So this would be the yod. This is number 10. This is a hey. This is number 5. This is a vav, which is a v sound, or a wav, which is a w sound. So it can be said, it's, it's what's called a Hebrew double. In Hebrew, there's seven doubles, which represent the seven physical attributes of the, of the human embryo, the body. So this is a six, a six value, and then this is a five again, okay? And so that has became a very popular word in Christianity, and everybody knows that word. That word is Jehovah. That's not what these glyphs are, but yet we have this ideology, we have this paradigm, this concept. And so it's hard for me to say yod hey vav hey, or put this glyph up here in this fashion and you not think of Jehovah. And immediately when you think of Jehovah, you think of some kind of a person or a personality. No matter who you are or where you're at. And, and it's not dealing with that other than this is your personality. This is who you are. This word or this Hebrew glyph is translated from the word Lord. And it's hard for you and me to think that when the Bible is talking about the Lord that it's talking about my physical body. But that's what it's talking about. And the reason it's talking about it in that fashion is that this glyph, which is part of the makeup, you can say that it's, it's fire, air, water and earth or you can say that it's uh, the north south east and west i mean you can, a lot of different ways you can apply this these four glyphs but they all are referring to the physical body the makeup the, the makeup of the physical body so when i read the word lord or i see those glyphs yod hey vav hey uh, i'm talking about the physical body and when it's introduced in genesis 2 that's the first place you see it genesis 2 4 First place you begin to see that glyph, then it begins to talk about how that the combination of Elohim, and which are the seven planetary powers or spheres, along with the twelve, you have the twelve, the seven, and the four, build a physical body. Now, here in verse 8, I know, again, you're familiar with it here. I want to read this to you. It says, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord is crucified or was crucified. Okay, when you read those, those words, there are words there that I could say these, many of these words are like code words. And so as a code word, it doesn't mean what it appears to mean. Like for instance, if it talks about the Lord, you are automatically thinking of one sovereign individual. That's how you are taught to think. You're not thinking about that yourself. And when you, you read the word crucified, now you're thinking about this sovereign individual was nailed to a tree or a cross or a post. So you're not seeing in that what the code is saying in that. And that's why I'm talking about our paradigms and our beliefs. Many times because they're taught wrong, we believe them and so we believe things wrong and it's hard to come back and believe it right. So in this passage of scripture, if I'm looking at it from a coded formula, I would realize it's talking about my physical body being crucified actually would be where the spirit slash soul left its eternal timelessness and moved into the dimension of time. So it crucified itself in time and that become you and me. So we begin, we limited ourselves in a sense, just in a sense, we limited ourselves to this dimension by lowering ourselves into this dimension. And so I wanted to read something to you from Alvin Boyd Kuhn. Phenomenal book. I highly recommend this book. Alvin Boyd Kuhn Collection, but I, would, I recommend all of his stuff. But I want to read you something he wrote here. It's quite lengthy, but let me just read this. He quotes this passage of scripture and he says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Here we have the revelation 
declaring in words as clear as can be found that our Lord was crucified, not in historical Jerusalem. See right there, there's a check there. It wasn't you all you always taught that he was crucified in Jerusalem, wasn't it? Yet that passage of scripture says he wasn't. That passage of scripture says he was crucified in the streets of Sodom and Egypt. Sodom being a city, Egypt being a nation. So we have words right here that are seemingly contradictory to the other thoughts that we've been taught. Isn't that right? Yep. Yep. So, but, you know, what do you do? Do you, do you X this out or tear this page out? Or do you tear one of the other pages out that says he's crucified in Jerusalem? I mean, what did we do with that? Obviously, anybody can geographically see there's a difference between Jerusalem and Egypt. Let me read on. Jerusalem was literal. Egypt was, was symbolic. Not only does this verse negate the whole literal and historical interpretations of the Gospel Chronicles, but it adds its own corroboration to the new rendering of the meaning of death. For the place where the dead body of two witnesses, the two segments of our dual life as soul and body, we talked, Beverly sang her song about it. Everything in the scripture talks about these two witnesses. You are the two witnesses as one individual. Your witnesses from soul slash spirit and body, slash sens sensual being. And both of those witnesses are true, but when both of those witnesses see the same thing, then you are a house united instead of divided. But when those two witnesses see different things, looking at the same thing is called confusion. Okay? And we get there, and we are stuck there in many ways, and don't recognize it. But as we begin to recognize it, as we begin to see it, do you know who it affects? It affects me. It affects you. When you see it, you become the recipient. You don't have to change anything or anybody. I mean, because it's not required. <laughs> Everything you can lack, allow it to just be. So let me read this again. He said... Not only does this verse negate the whole literal historical interpretation of the Gospel Chronicle, but it adds its own corroboration to a new rendering of the meaning of death. For the place where the dead bodies of the two witnesses, the two segments of our dual life as soul and body, will lie as well as where Christ in us is crucified is thus marked as a place of death, which, as the new truth reveals, is this earth and our life upon it. And it is further significant that Revelation gives us one of its many names, Egypt. No one can, can long study Hebrew, Greek, and Egyptian religious literature without being assured that this term Egypt is used never in a sense of geographical unit on a map, but as a chief designation for the place or the country or the habitat of earthly incarnation. So what he's saying right there, it doesn't matter if you were born in North Georgia in a U.S. of A, in the typology you were born in Egypt just simply because you as spirit soul took on a physical body. The physical body is represented by the nation of Egypt. It's not to say that Egypt is a bad place or a good place or something against the other. It's to use a word as a phraseology or typology of the physical body. <coughs> so... Egypt is used never in the sense of a geographical unit on a map, but as a chief designation for the place, the country, or habitat of earthly incarnation. It is therefore a figurative term for life on earth. 
or earth as a scene of incarnate life. To go down into Egypt is a certain cryptogram for the descent into carnation. Now, if I said descent into carnation, really what I'm talking about is the fall of God, in other words, that that's timeless, into time. So the only thing that took a descent or a fall was God. So if I'm going to look at Scripture to find out who fell, I have to recognize it was God that failed or lowered itself into temporality. That's a good thing. <laughs> That's a good thing for you and me. If I can come to grips with that and recognize that, then I don't look at myself as an old failure. But religion has taught us to do that. And so we look at our life without recognizing what we're doing because we have been taught year after year. It's just been ingrained into us. I'm just an old sinner. Uh, da, 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 da. You know, you know the phrase. We've all said it. We all put ourselves inside <laughs> that box, and it's hard worthy. to get out of it. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. You know, and, and what we do then is we begin to look at our life through the through the magnifying glass of religion, and we look at our life as a failure or a mistake, or a this, a that, or that, rather than to look at our life as it must be glorious for God to fall or descend and come into it. And when I can see it that way, and I begin to realize that, wow, God really loves me. <laughs> God really loves my body. God really loves this creation that He's created. So my soul is going to fall into it. That's what's so crazy though, and even, even taking it from a literalist point of view, it says, Paul tells us, know ye not that you are the temple. Absolutely. I don't, if you're, even if you're still taking it literal, what was just said there? Yeah. What was really said is, you really don't know where the temple of God is at. That's really what's That's said what there. Said. You just don't really know that. And to get to know that, to get to know that my life, myself, is that way whether I'm up or whether I'm down, no matter where I'm at in the journey. So, let me read on here. It says, and here we have an interesting sidelight on the meaning of the term often used, and of course used erroneously, the flesh pots of Egypt. In our ignorance of ancient symbolism, we have taken it to mean cooking pots full of edible flesh or meat on which we feed more or less gluttonously. It was supposed to be a reference to our addiction to the gastronomical pleasures of consuming a lot of beef, pork, or mutton. But in the light of, of the corrected view, it is at once seen to denote nothing more than these physical bodies of ours. Wow. For they are indeed the vessels, parentheses, pots of flesh in which our souls have taken lodgment for the period of the life cycle it has on earth. Mm -mm -mm. Isn't, that, isn't that wonderful? That's good. Whew. Uh, so we're called pots of flesh? Is that what he's saying? That's what we're called. Flesh pots. Have you not ever heard of the flesh pots of Egypt? Yeah. That term, that's what he's referring to. That's what your physical yeah. body is. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Yeah, when you start to recognize that, and you realize that many of these words and terminology, it's just like there was a phrase that, that, I, was, that I was reading a book, and it, this phrase has come to me, and I, I read it out of the book, but it, it, uh, it resonated with me. If I'm going to try to talk about God or try to discuss God and call it infinity or eternity or timeless, the circle is how I do that. However, if all I have is a circle, then I have nothing, right? But that's what God is. God is nothing. But that's hard for us to put our brain around simply because the circle encompasses everything. 
So how can a circle be nothing and be everything at the same time? The reason it is, is you can't put